Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mariela Salinas, and I'm a marketing specialist here at Educate 360. Welcome to today's webinar, Use Cases Are Back, presented by our expert instructor for today, Dr. Susan Heidorn. We will be in Zoom for today's session, and we will be sharing a copy of this recording with you in an email after the webinar. We do encourage participation throughout the webinar, so please use the chat option or the Q&A option for our short Q&A portion after the presentation. Educate360 is so excited to present this webinar today. I will now hand it over to you, Susan. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome. Um, happy Wednesday. Uh, this is about use cases, and use cases are back, yes. Um, why am I so excited? I love use cases. Um, they are one of my favorite tools. And they had a waned a little bit, but they are getting back and getting popular even in the agile environment. So I'm so excited to, to see. Once you've been in this industry for a long time, you know, there's tools that ebb and wane. You know, they're really popular for a while, like data flow diagrams were really popular. Everybody used to do them, and now you hardly see them at all. And kind of the same thing with use cases, because it, it was kind of like the technology group got into too much technology into the use cases and everybody goes well that's not my thing especially on the business side and then they they did a resurgence because they are perfect also to be able to use in the agile environment we're going to be talking all about that today so i'm so glad you could join so welcome to the good news that use cases are coming back so we're going to talk about first of all what is a use case people confuse them with user stories uh, and some other things. So we're going to define exactly what a use case is and when when would you really want to use them? They're, they're not for everything. We're going to talk about the core components and notation in a use case. We're going to talk about other models that integrate really well with use cases. And then we'll talk about kind of the difference that there, there's some similarities between use cases and user stories. And then there's some differences and, and being really clear about what those differences are so you know kind of when to use a use case and when not to use a use case. So let's get started. Uh, a long, long time ago, <laughs> use cases actually got, um, I think, were birthed um, during the object-oriented um, world in the 1990s. And uh, use cases uh, started getting gaining popularity. And the whole way that use cases started is a story. Tell me a story. Tell me a story about how you want to use the system from a business perspective. Okay, so what do you want it to do? So it's really almost like documenting a play. Only the play is between the actor, which is the end user, who's ever using the interface, and the system. So it's not between two people like we normally think of when we go to a play, but it's between an actor and a system. It describes that conversation. It talks about, okay, as an actor, what do you want the system to do for you? So I need to be able to do this, and I want the system to respond this way. I need to do this. I want the system to respond this way. It's a conversation to be able to look for what are those observable and that's the keyword observable, outwardly visible, if you will, functional requirements. So this is a great way, a great tool to be able to capture those functional requirements that the actor who's ever interfacing with that use case can see. It also captures a sequence of events. Um, it's kind of like a mini process. You do this you know, if I say, if I want this, then you, the, I want the system to respond this way. If I do this, I want the system to respond this way. So is telling people exactly, okay, if I do this, this is what I expect back. There is no misinterpretation. It's what I want back. So they are really a nice tool to be able to define those functional requirements where users' stories, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, are really focused on the stakeholder requirements. What does the stakeholder need to be able to do? If they need to be able to do that, then what does the system need to do? And that's kind of taking that user story and adding to that those functional requirements. So it's really clear to the business side. It's really clear to the technologists who are building this and the project team. What do you have to build? There you go. So use cases are just one view, though, of 
the the whole more system perspective of the the solution. So as you look here, this is our concurrent solution model. So we have process models that just look at process from a process perspective. You know, so we have the swim lanes and workflows and process maps, et cetera. But their focus is looking at the process, who's doing what. Data modeling looks at the data. You know, it looks at the relationship diagrams, class diagrams. What data do we have? What are their attributes? What is um, the data we need? How are they related to one another? So that's from a data view. And then we have scope requirements, such as use a use case diagram actually is a scope requirement. And we're going to be looking at that, but looking at um, context, um, again, impact mapping, story maps, product roadmaps are all to understand the scope. Also, user interface modeling. So we might do a pr prototype of a user interface, prototype of a report, whatever. The view that we're going to look at in this our session is use case modeling. This talks about the interaction, the interaction between the business and the solution. Okay, and there's different models. We'll talk about the different models as we move forward. It feeds really nice into additionally benefit. Uh, edits, messages, test cases, um, and scenarios. And so we're going to talk about each one as we go forward. Use case model it consists of two parts. Okay, First part is use case diagram, which is more of the scoping mechanism for the model. And then the use case narrative. You need both to create the model. So one is more of a pictorial visual which is really nice for 65% of us, according to research, are visual learners. So it's kind of nice to have a picture, but it's only a high level picture. Each of the information on your use case diagram will be dived into around something called a narrative. This is just what is the process in this use case, like a little mini process. And we'll kind of sh show you that as we get dig down deeper. So we talked about the use case diagram, it visually depicts the scope. So what is the scope? Well, the scope here is the banking system and it's, it shows you what's in scope and out of scope. So the banking system is in scope because it's in a box. And a lot of times when you do scope diagrams, you either can do a circle or a box. Everything in is in scope, everything outside is out of scope to our conversation at that time. So a use case diagram is a scope diagram. It says, okay, I'm going to look at all of this. This is in scope, how the banking system makes deposits, transfer funds, makes withdrawals. It's everything the banking system can do that I wanna look at. And then we have actors, and we'll talk about the different types of actors, um, but they interact with those use cases. They interact with those little mini, mini processes. So the bank customer, what can the bank customer do in the banking system, well, they can make a deposit, transfer funds, make withdrawals. What does the teller do? Well, they can make deposit, transfer funds, make withdraw, balance transactions, open account. So it, it really kind of shows you who does what. And the lines here are those interfaces. So as a person actor, I'm going to need a user interface to talk to this computer software because how am I going to speak to it if I don't have has some type of communication tool? Another system will just use a system-to-system -system interface or a device or anything else. So they need interfaces to talk to the system in view, in scope, which would be the banking system. So let's break it down a little bit more. We got a boundary box. This is just a, a, just a really quick way to look at notation because it is modeled using UML notation, which is the Unified Modeling Language notation that the, all the object-oriented diagrams are utilizing. So we got a system boundary, which is the banking system. Okay, so this is a boundary box. We have the name of the system. We have the actor, and we have a use case. Use case, again, is a little mini process that adds value to the actor. Um, originally, all actors were stick figures, but even when we have a system actor, we used to do stick figures, and they and people who look at a stick figure say, 
oh, that's a person, but this is really uh, another system. This is not a person. And so um, they kind of left the, <laughs> left the notation to be more broader, use your own notation to, to make it more readable. And then you have an association, basically interface. I need a user interface to talk to a system. A system to system will need a, a system to system interface or system device, whatever that is. So that those are the actors that interact with the system. And this is a use case. So the use case are just little bubbles. They're little mini processes, just like a process, verb, noun. What is it? Make deposit. It doesn't tell you a whole lot. When you narrate it out, you'll give it a description of what does make deposit look like. But just for the diagram itself, it's just short. It represents a small piece of the behavior of the system, functional behavior. It does not, use cases don't include non-functional behaviors. So all those illities, availability, portability, reliability, scalability, uh, et cetera, security, doesn't include any of those. So you still have to get those. Doesn't include business rules either. You still have to capture them. And remember when I said it captures observable outwardly observable requirements, outwardly visible requirements. It doesn't include any back-end processing that a actor would not see. So it represents the goal of the actor. What do I want this solution to do? What, what do I need to be able to? I need to be able to make a deposit. Otherwise, just, you know, don't bother me. I need to make a deposit. So these are like little mini processes that add value to an actor. It describes... In response to an actor's request, I want to make a deposit. What do I expect the solution to do? So there's all types of actors, and I talked about this a little bit early, is that there's human actors. Okay, so examples, we have a customer, accounts payable clerk. These are roles. We usually never use titles, roles. So who, who's going to interact it? Maybe it's a, a manager role, it could be an end user role, whoever's going to use the system. Then it can be system as actor. Examples could be other computer systems, database systems, interface devices, okay? Then we have a temporal event and a temporal event is based on time. So all of these actors trigger the system to, to wake up and do something because the system, if you, you look at your computer systems, your applications, apps on your phone, doesn't matter. They, they will sit there forever, forever, in the rain and the snow and the sleet. Think of an ATM machine. They won't do anything until what? They are told to do something, either by another system, another human, um, a time, month end, year end, nightly processing, a control event. You know, maybe out of stock. You no, know, oh, yep, those fuchsia bike shorts are getting low. Uh, we have three left. You know, kick out a request to get some more. So something triggers the system to act. And that would be an actor, just like when you go to your ATM machine. The ATM machine just stays there, stands there, you know, just sun, rain, snow, sleet. Of course, some of you probably don't have the snow, but in Minnesota, <laughs> we do. It just stand, it stays there until we do what? We trigger it to wake up. We put in our little card and it goes, hello, Susan, what would you like? Well, it doesn't talk to me yet. It'll do that tomorrow maybe, but it, it asks you, okay, what do you want to do? Are you going to withdraw? Are you going to deposit? What, are you, what do you want me to do? So it's always triggered by an actor. It says, hey, hey, don't just sit there. I want you to do something. That is the relationship, the conversation between the system and the person or actor, which could be anything. So then you take and say, okay, make deposit. Great, great, Susan can make deposit. What does that tell me? Okay, well, what we wanna do is create a narrative so that we know what it tells us. Okay, so the use case starts when the teller does what? Enters the account number. Now there's gonna be some preconditions. So we're gonna assume that the teller's already um, logged in and the system's up and running, you know, so there's going to be some preconditions before that. So in this case, if we're just making deposit, we're only looking at that little piece of functionality, not everything else, 
not how they logged in, not how they got into the system or anything else, just this piece of functionality. So it starts when the teller enters the account number. And then the system, what does the system do? Okay, it checks the account number, it prompts for the deposit amount. It's like, okay, well now the teller's going to respond to the system and say, oh, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put my deposit amount, they enter it and maybe the system performs a reasonability check, validates that the number is correct, adds it to the deposit amount to the current balance of my account, and then the system updates a teller and the system notifies. But you see where it all starts, right? It starts with a teller. The system doesn't do anything until it's told to do something. So if I do this, the system responds. If I do this, the system responds. So if the teller enters the account number, system checks and prompts for deposit amount. And when I enter the deposit amount, it checks to make sure that I haven't fat fingered anything as the deposit amount updates the teller transaction file. Okay, so now I can give this to a developer and they go, okay, I can, I know what you're, what you're looking for. So this is such a nice add-on to also user stories, but you can use it in um, more traditional approaches as well. So each of these, each of these primary flows um, have a flow of events, okay? So I can take many paths through the woods, which path am I gonna take? And so narratives always include a precondition, which is true. I'm signed in, got through the logged in, systems up and running, you know, whatever has to be true before this use case starts, before this little me process starts, this has to be true. Then you have a primary flow. You always have to have a primary flow. What's the main path that I take to get my, my money from my ATM machine? Okay, what is, the, what is the first things that I do? And then alternative flows. Okay, so alternatives are things that uh, maybe didn't go quite right. Maybe I fat fingered something. It's like, oh, I, I put up 100.000. Well, it's gonna say, Susan, that's not right. <laughs> and give me an error message. Uh, or if I fat finger a password, you know, I mean, those are the things, those error messages come in. So we have alternative flows, and then we have exception flows. Okay, go to the ATM, maybe I am using someone else's card and, they, and it was reported as stolen. It's like, oh, you're not getting anything. Nope, 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 that's exception. Anytime you stop the process from getting to a host condition, what happens at the end of the process? That is an exception flow. So, whoops, sorry about that. My little mouse got a little wild there. Okay, so precondition, what happens before the use case can begin? These have to be true. All of this has to be true before we can start. And post condition is what is the state of the system at the end of the use case? At the end, I get that amount um, added to my deposit account or savings account. So again, primary flow, most likely path, it's the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of the time people are going to go through this path. It, it doesn't have to be 80, it could be 60-40, but it's the, the majority of the time. The majority of the time people use ATMs to probably withdraw inf money versus making a deposit. So what is the goal? What do I want it to, it to do at the end? So it portrays usually when everything is going right. Um, alternative flows, again, are the different paths. It's like, wow, I have two paths in the woods. Which ones do I need to take? You know, maybe I fat fingered it. Maybe I realized I did. I went to the ATM machine. I didn't have enough money. I wanted to draw, withdraw $200. I didn't have that. So it says, um, think again, girl. Um, so I, that's an alternative flow. Now, what do I do? Oh, well, maybe it asked me to, you know, rethink that. Maybe I can get $50 instead of $200. So that is an alternative flow. Or if I fat finger something or, or, or I can't find an item that I wanna order or anything. So it's an alternative flow through the process. And then exception flows, that prevents that post condition, that ending state from being reached. Oh, fraud detected. No, you can't, you can't get any money. Thank you very much. Or maybe I go, oh, do you know what? Oh, I wanted I wanted $200, but I can't, I, I don't have $200. So I have to, you know, I'm just going to cancel out. You know, I forgot that I didn't put my check in or whatever. I know most people have automatic checking, but some people still don't. So, 
you know, maybe I forgot, oh shoot, it's in my purse. I got to, you know, get that out first and put money in so I can dig money out. Um, so that is going to prevent you from reaching that post condition. So then as you make the narrative, you saw one narrative. Um, originally, actually, uh, use cases were just tell me a story. So they just, you know, in paragraphs, tell me a story. The use case begins when da 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 da, -da. It's the same thing that we had before, but it's just, you know, it's in paragraph form. Paragraph form is high, harder for people to read and synthesize because if I gave a paragraph to a business person, they'd go, you know, I don't have time to make it simpler for me, right? Because you don't want to miss anything in the story. So then came out the, the primary flow. It's like, let's make it steps. I can understand it. Step one, step two, step one. The teller does something that always has to start with an actor. Then the system does something. And then the actor does something. And the system does something. So just a simple step-by-step -step narrative. The one that I use and I tell my students to use is more of a structure. I'm just a table person anyway, because I read it better that way. Same stuff, same information, but it makes it simpler. Step one is the actor. Oh, step one always has to be the actor. So use case starts. And then what, what does the system do? System looks for account number and props for deposit amount. Then it goes back to the teller. Okay, teller, your turn. Enter the amount. And then the system performs the check, adds the deposit amount, updates the transaction file, and lets the teller know, hey, done. So the teller can let me know that. So another thing about use cases, just an FYI, it's always focused on whoever has access to the user interface. So if I'm I walked into the bank or walked up, you know, to the machine at the, the bank and said, okay, you know, here's my deposit amount, it goes up the tube and or or check and then they process it. I have no control over that user interface. I have a conversation with the teller saying, here, I'd like to deposit this check and, you know, thank you very much and give me my receipt. But that is not a use case piece. We don't care what the teller does or says to me. We care about how the teller interacts with the system. Now, let's say I'm doing this um, virtually. Maybe I'm, I'm making a deposit on my phone, just taking a picture, okay? Then I am an actor because I am operating the user interface and I'm talking to the system through that. So um, we talked about alternative flows. Okay, so I fat fingered, invalid account. So that's where you go, the alternative. Oh, we can't go left around the tree. Now we have to go right around the tree. So um, pre the account number entered is not valid. And so we are going to, the system displays a message. This is where errors and messages come from. So not only do you understand the functional requirements, of, oh, this is a good time for an error message. What do we want it to say? So it says account number not found. It launches a search and says, okay, um, I can't find the account number, but do you want to search by last name or, you know, whatever? And it's like, oh, okay, there's there's Susan. So they then I just go back. So I went around the tree, following the same path, go back, and it's like, okay, uh, deposit amount, Susan. It, it is wow. That that's a million. Did you really mean a million dollars? No, oh uh, no, I did not mean a million dollars. So it says deposit amount entered is outside of reasonability range. Um, deposit not valid. Maybe I put three zeros after the point, decimal point. Re so I re-enter. It's like, oh, okay. So I'm going to re-enter it. And then it goes back to the system. And now you can also add business rules, which is really nice. The business rule, maybe there's a reasonability limit on deposits. You know, maybe you can only make a deposit up to a certain amount of money. If it's over that, then maybe they have to get a supervisor's approval or make sure that you don't have access to a million dollars until they know the check is good. So that's alternative flows. Exception flows can happen anywhere in the system. You know, I, I may, may be making a deposit. It's like, oh, no, I decided to change my mind. You know, a lot of times you can order. You're ordering something on, on the web. And it's like, 
oh, really? By the time it's taxes and shipping and everything, it's like, well, I really don't want that. So I'm going to cancel out. It just takes you to where back where you started from. And that's that's what exception flows are. So it's really good at that. So there's no post condition. It just goes back to the starting point going, OK, well, start again. So supplementary models to use for use cases, activity diagrams. Activity diagrams are like little process flows like you're all used to, except the process flow focuses on what the system processes are, not what the people processes are. Because most of the time when we do a, a process flow, we're going to go, okay, so um, I, I need to do this, and then I do this, and then I do this, and I do this, and then Sally does this, and then Bob does this, and then I do this, you know, so it's just, it's about the people process, right? In this case, Originally, it, well, in most cases, it's about the system process. But the interesting thing is a lot of people use UML now for people process too, because people get used to the notation. So just as you're looking at the process going, is this a system process or is this really a people process using the notation? So an activity diagram is just, you know, get the system gets the account number and deposit amount. It validates that. Uh, it has decision points, but there's no you know, question in there just tells you where to go. In this case, account number not valid. Nope. So then display the message and then and then offer a search on customer name, or I would probably say display um, customer name. And so it's just, it's what, what is the process of the system? What is it doing? It does this and then does this. And then it, you know, if it's account number is not valid, go here. If the account number is valid, you know, it'd probably move on to somewhere else. So that is an activity diagram. You can diagram out one use case or many use cases as they work together. Uh, class diagram. So just like an entity relationship diagram, um, class diagrams are very similar, except they encapsulate operations as well. So you have a product. This would be called a class in entity relationship world. It would be called an entity. Attributes. Same thing, product ID, name, code type, whatever. And then the interesting thing about object-oriented development, it also encapsulizes the processes it works on. So it says it'll display the product and get product details. So it'll it'll put both into a class. And it feeds into wonderfully to user interface prototypes. What does the user interface look like that I have to use in order to communicate with a system that will sit there until I tell it to do something. So you can, you know, uh, do prototypes, edits and messages, you know, account number not found, or I'm sorry, your password is not valid. You know, think again, all those wonderful messages we get when we utilize applications. And then it feeds wonderfully into test cases. So you can kind of help that along. So, you know, it's kind of the same thing. What is the action? You know, selected internet banking option from homepage. Okay, what's my expected benefit? System displays list accounts. I select the desired account. Oh, the system has to display at least 20 most recent, you know. And so the actor does something. The system does, you know, response is something. That's the expected result. And then you say, well, there's pass and fail. So it kind of feeds really nicely into them. So why... Do we want to do cut <laughs> use case? Excuse me a second. A little tick on my throat. My apologies. So it helps the business articulate their needs because they got they got something in their head. They have a vision oftentimes in it. And we try and get that vision out through requirements or at least an understanding through user stories. But it helps because they because they kind of know what they want the system to do. Oftentimes they even come with a solution, unfortunately, but they also say, well, I just, you know, and so so we're asking them, it's like, okay, what do you expect to see back? And and then they say, Well, I would like this. And it's like, okay, so you know what they're expecting. They're ensuring that there's business value, just like user stories kind of have that motivation type thing to add value. Is it, what is your goal? Um, it certainly supports communication so that there's no misinterpretation. It's like, yep, yeah, this is what they wanted. You either give it to them or they don't give it to them. 
Um, it identifies the normal path, the primary path, the alternative paths, the error um, conditions, which is really kind of nice. So it shows all the different, you know, alternative paths, exception paths, uh, certainly defines scope because what's in that box is in scope. Anything outside the box is out of scope. Uh, certainly a easy way to have conversations and elicit further requirements. Um, used again as edits and messages, user interface to test cases. We talked about that already. Um, again, observable functionality only. And also the nice thing is, is it identifies, at least the diagram does, external entities and actors. So when you're doing that use case diagram, it says, okay, here are all the roles that are going to use this application. Uh, and here are all the other systems, which means, you know, do we have a current interface or system to system interface, or do we have to create one system to device? What about temporal events? So it gives you a more understanding about um, understanding all your stakeholders who are going to be using this, making sure you don't forget them when you're trying to get requirements and figuring out how many interfaces. Do I need to make a user interface for certain groups? Do I make just one and everybody uses it and they just have different security, um, system to system interfaces, et cetera. But it is, uh, use cases do have their limitations. I'm sorry to say, even though it is one of my favorite, favorite tools. It, um, if you are looking um, and working on a data or batch process um, application, yeah, it's not very good because it's about observable functional requirements. If it's back end processing things that an actor normally would work on, you yeah, don't need it. Um, this is where we got into trouble. I'm going to say that everybody got so excited about use cases and I would give them to my developers and the developers develop app, but they started using it as a design document. So the temptation was to start designing it. It's not only what is requirements focus on the what. We started technically doing the how. Well, how are we technically going to do that? And let's add this to it. And pretty soon, use cases became more of a design document. And when you gave it to the business, their eyes rolled in the back of their head because it's like, oh, want all that. that. Well, that's an IT thing because I would hear that from my clients. That's an IT thing. That's an IT thing. Use cases are an IT thing. They were never meant to be an IT thing. They were meant to be a conversation with the business so we understood what they wanted. But then they got into all the design aspects and then, you know, it was hands off. Um, doesn't capture backend processing, interface uh, requirements, non-functional requirements, business rules. Doesn't so you still have to get them. Um, they are time consuming. I have probably, um, when I do use cases, I usually have at least a couple iterations, if not three. I usually um, start capturing them and then show them to the stakeholders and then you know they can reiterate if I missed anything. Um, so they, they do take a little time. I don't know if they're that you know, extremely time consuming, but they do take time. Um, less useful if you don't know what the outcome is or the goal is, because it's all about adding value. It's all about getting to the goal at the end of this little mini process. What do I get? If you don't know what you get, I guess anything will do to use that old adage. Um, may lead into incorporating too much detail. As I said, that starts getting into the interface stuff. So this is just, it's high level, but it, points you in the right direction of what's needed and what's expected. So there are some commonalities between use cases and user stories, and which um, I've been really encouraged to, to find out that, um, and, and saw in person that more Agile teams are now using use cases too. And only you only go to the depth that you want. Let's have a conversation. Here's your user story. Let's get, dig deeper. There are some um, commonalities. They both they list, all elicit requirements, certainly, and define and prioritize. Uh, use, so use cases are prioritized as well as user stories. Um, certainly identifies the actors, the users, uh, creates you can create personas. It helps with that. Uh, describes the the actor and the user. So 
oftentimes in use cases, you would define the role or define the, the user or actor, certainly the actor goal and what the role is about, uh, initiates conversation. So what are user stories? They're a placeholder for conversation. What is the use case? Placeholder for conversation, only a little bit more detailed than user, user stories get to. And um, certainly user stories provide um, both provide, well, provide information. If you look at the acceptance criteria in a user story, that feeds into the test cases as well as use cases. So what are their differences? There is a little bit of difference. Um, sometimes you might have conversation with different people. So in a use case, the, the business analyst usually goes out to the end user, the stakeholders and say, hey, what do you want this solution to do? So tell me, tell me how you're gonna use it. Tell me what you expect. User stories are between usually the, the team and the product owner. Now that doesn't have to be, but that's some. Um, use cases describe the interaction between the actor and the system, where as you know, user stories is what the user wants to do and why. Uh, narrative, uh, unique, uh, certainly use cases have that goal. They have a trigger, like I said, something has to trigger it. Preconditions, uh, post conditions, full of events. Um, the narrative format for user stories, as you probably know, is you got a user. As a user, I want to be able to do this so that I can do, you know, something. So it gives the motivation. Uh, the focus is always on the solution in the use case. The focus of a user story is the who, what, and why of that product feature. So user stories may come first, and then you might want to say, well, let's do a use case, dive a little bit deeper. Use it as a conversation tool, as a communication tool. Um, use cases used to create a list of functional requirements for um, a developer to implement and uh, certainly determine user needs and priority, prioritize features for the business goals. And use cases that have a little bit more, they shouldn't be extremely detailed, but a little bit more detailed. Um, you can always start with your, your user story and then just say, well, let's let's talk about that. It can also work with your um, acceptance criteria. And user stories are short and succinct. So that's kind of some of the differences. So uh, use cases um, in an agile environment, certainly context, and a lot of this I talked about already, context for the user stories helps prioritize user stories because you know what kind of functions you may need. Um, shows the interaction between the users and the system. Um, again, focusing more on the functional requirements, which a user story doesn't always give you. Um, the best you can do is through acceptance criteria. Uh, discovers the beginning and end states, the post conditions, the preconditions, alternatives, and exception paths. Um, it helps drive down those big, huge epics those user stories that are too huge to do anything with, those higher level user stories, and it helps decompose them because you can look at, okay, what are the key use cases that this user story might need? And then it supports um, the development of the use case, and you only do it to the level you need, you know? Um, Use cases can can certainly get more detailed. And, you know, like I said, it goes into edits and messages. It can go into test cases. If you don't want to use it that way, if you just want to say, okay, yeah, I have a user story. I'm not sure what is going on with that. I'm not sure that I understand it. Let's do a use case to just make it more clear. And then it's still, it just takes that conversation and digs um, a little deeper, dives down a little bit deeper. So that's some of the benefits of use cases. So when do you wanna use a use case? Um, when you have interaction requirements, when you have a solution that is a system, cause you can have solutions other, otherwise. Um, when you need to identify stakeholders expectations, cause you're not sure that, you know, you might be on the same page. So you wanna clarify them. And then when you wanna understand alternative and exception paths, it's like, okay, so then we got the main path, but did we consider as we're developing this, did we consider the alternative paths? Did we consider the exception paths? They may be captured in 
um, your acceptance criteria, but maybe not, maybe we forgot it. So it has some really nice conversations there. When not to use, uh, when the solution is not a system, no, they're really not necessarily then. Some people have used them in that way, but I think kind of waste of time. Uh, when it has a quick fix, when there's no human interaction, and um, when there's enough detail in the user story. You know, if you, if you think you've got it, you think you understand it, then you probably don't need to do a use case. But if you don't understand a user story and you want to dig a little deeper, it might be a good thing to do. So um, just in case you are intrigued about what user stories um, can bring to you, uh, we do have a two-day class coming up in June, June 24th, 25th. And we have some additional other skill classes that feed nicely in it. Um, use case modeling strictly focuses on all the use case models. So the use case diagram, the narrative, activity diagrams, test cases, all of that in those two. And you really actually in our classes um, create them. And uh, there's some additional ones. Our business analysis modeling essentials classes, two days, but it covers process models covers scope models, it covers use cases, and it covers prototyping. So if you want a little bit of, everything's kind of like a little buffet of models. Uh, certainly business process modeling drills down just to all the different business process types. Uh, facilitation skills, because oftentimes when you do these, you want to facilitate a group um, to get all the information you need. And if you're more into agile, that will certainly talk about agile business analysis. So that was a fast uh, worldwide <laughs> view of use cases. And uh, does anyone have any questions? Anyone? Hey there, Susan. Oh, yep. Um, we had a question about, is this a software? Software is use cases a software? Is that the question? I believe so, but so yes, use yeah. cases are actually a model and a tool. Uh, there are tools that will help you do use cases or capture use case information. Um, sometimes they start getting a little designy again. So a lot of times an IT group will will use that, but um, you don't need it. And you can just do it, do it in a Word document or Excel spreadsheet. It can be simple, especially if you're just having it as a conversational piece. Um, but there are tools out there that can also help you with them. Excellent. Um, I will give our audience about another like minute or two to throw in any last minute questions. Oh, we actually have a question here. Um, and yeah, I actually, we will be sending out a recording of this webinar. Um, yep, just in case you miss the first 15 minutes, actually. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, if you need any more info on this topic, audience, we will definitely have a plethora of info on watermarklearning.com. We also will be, again, sending out this recording in an email after the webinar. And it does count for uh, a ways of working PDU if I'm not mistaken. Yep, yep. Wait, ways of working PDU. So you can claim one for this webinar and a link. Can you send them the link, Mariella, to uh, .com? You know I can. Awesome, um, awesome. But absolutely everyone. So yeah, if you were unable to attend, we have another question here. Oh uh, yeah, do you, do you struggle to convince people to use use cases? Um, I actually just, I interview people and then I start creating the use case and then I, and they get it. I mean, again, as long as you don't have all the design in there, but, um, not really, I, I use it as kind of a communication tool and then they're going, oh yeah, that can, that makes sense. So, and you can, use, you know, use, use it at any time. You can use it as a conversation tool. You can work to, um, certainly in more detail, but, um. They're a great tool. Absolutely. And we will also be following up with a couple of class links in the email. So yeah, if you register for this webinar, you will most definitely be getting um, links to all of the classes and 
and that anything else. Um, we have a couple more here in Q and A. Um, Susan, if you have like a five minutes, I think there's Absolutely. really fantastic questions. Um, in what scenarios do you recommend a digital analyst use use cases? A digital analyst. Hmm. Um, probably, you know, really kind of the same way if you're, as long as there's a solution involved, you know, it's just, it really is just saying, gee, as, you know, a human person, what do you, what do you need the solution to do? And then you just have the conversation. Well, then if they, it does this, then what do you want? If it does this, then what do you want? Uh, do you use the ROI in your um, use case? Uh, I don't, um, it depends on, return on investment for the whole application um, is really usually in either the business business case um, or the project charter, whatever you're doing. Um, but the, the return on investment, if you're trying to convince people to do um, use cases, which is kind of a different, I just, like I said, I just use it as a communication tool and I've never had any problems of having people um, not do it as long as I explained what it was. Because sometimes they're going like, what it, what is this? And we'll just go, well, let's just, it's just a conversation. Let's kind of, I just want to make sure I understand. And then you put them through the process and go, oh, yeah, I get it. Yeah, okay. Excellent. Well, yeah, we had a bunch of fantastic comments too, just about how you can use this for automation testing software and between business analysts. It's just yeah. fantastic. It, it's, it's, just, it's so flexible and so robust and, and oh. kind, of, kind of simple, which was what, what it was meant to be. It wasn't meant to be convoluted. It's just, let's, let's talk about the story. How do you want to, how do you want to do this? And like I said, I keep it in the table contents, actor system, actor system, so that's just easier for people to absorb versus a whole paragraph. They're going, now, now who's doing what? Why are we talking about this? <laughs> Excellent. All righty. Well, I think that answers all the questions. So thank you all so much all right. for attending today. And thank you so much again, Susan. This is awesome. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a great day. Absolutely. Enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you so much again for attending. Bye, everyone.